Good afternoon uh, or good morning or possibly evening, depending where you are joining us from. Welcome to AM's new for 2023 webinar. It's worth noting this is a two part webinar and we're going to be looking at five collections in today's webinar. Now, do make sure you jot down the time 3 p.m. GMT, Thursday the 9th of February into your diaries as well. Uh, there will be another five or so collections that we are looking at later in the week as well. So hopefully this afternoon's webinar will wet everybody's beak ready for later on in the week. But we do have some fantastic things to take a look at today as well. So first things first, it's probably worth running through a little bit of housekeeping with everybody. Please do note that today's webinar is recorded. So um, by remaining in this meeting, you are also consenting to being recorded. Any questions that you submit, for instance, will be recorded. It's also worth noting everyone apart from myself and our panelists today is muted. But uh, if you should have questions, uh, there is a chat function and a questions function as part of your GoToWebinar setup. So you're able to communicate with uh, myself and also the marketing team that we have behind the scenes on GoToWebinar today through that. If you're experiencing any technical issues, please do pop a message through using the, the chat function and we will do everything that we can to help sort you out as well. Um, it's worth noting when I mentioned questions as well, um, that obviously we have five fantastic speakers today and they are all going to take questions from the audience, but we're gonna save questions for the very end. So each of our speakers will run through the collection that they are talking about, and then we will do joint questions towards the end. That does mean that you have a little bit of extra time to submit any questions that you might have for them. and. I suppose while I am mentioning technical issues as well, the one issue that I find people have more often than not with GoToWebinar would be joining without audio. If you are struggling with the audio, I would recommend that you rejoin and double check your audio selections. Hopefully anybody that isn't able to hear that advice currently will be able to see the pictures on this slide and jump back into us with some sound. I'll leave that up for just a second longer to make sure that anybody who is frantically taking a look at those pictures and isn't able to hear my voice is able to see that at least. But moving on, once I've found my mouse, here we go. For those of us who haven't encountered um, AM before or haven't uh, taken a look through any of our collections previously, AM's digital collections and technology platforms enrich the study, research and teaching of primary sources. With over 30 years experience working with librarians, educators and archivists, AM is inspired by archival materials and passionate about the technology that brings them to life. We partner with libraries, archives and heritage institutions all across the world to digitize the world's historical and cultural knowledge. With AM, our customers can discover award-winning archival collections learn how to use them and even create their own. Now we have five incredible collections to introduce to you today. Each of these is brand new for AM for 2023. On Thursday you'll be able to hear about a couple more and also some continuation of our award-winning collections as well. Now I don't want to give too much away about each of these collections because I'm sure the editors will be able to do a much better job of introducing them than I will be. But suffice to say, we have a fantastic array of content today covering a number of different regions and time periods as well. Now, first up, we have Erin Pearson Wilbury, who is a senior editor in our editorial production team. Erin's going to be introducing you to Africa and the new imperialism. Um, European borders on the African continent, 1870 to 1914. So it's a pretty extensive resource that looks at Africa in the age of new imperialism and really uncovers the history of European colonization and exploitation across the African continent. Erin, what I'm going to do is give you access to my keyboard and my mouse. Um, you should get a little notification shortly and I'm gonna take you on to your next slide there. And Erin, you should have control. Thanks, Dot. Yeah, that seems to be working, thank you. 
Hi everyone. So as Dot mentioned, my name is Erin Pearson Wilbury, and I'm a senior editor here at AM. I've been managing our Africa and the New Imperialism collection, which we are hoping to publish later this month. This project focuses on the period of rapid European colonial and imperialist expansion across the African continent during the late 19th and early 20th centuries. What makes this such an interesting time period is just the sheer amount of change and shifting power dynamics that happens over a huge geographical area in such a short amount of time. The dates that we're focusing on with this resource are around 1870 to about 1914. So in roughly 40 years, the continent goes from being around 10% controlled by or influenced by European powers to about 90% controlled by or colonized by, or in massive scare quotes, claimed by European powers. So there's a huge cultural, social, and political shift within this time period. We've worked with 11 archives to produce this resource, and they're situated across the UK, the US, and France in order to um, present collections from key individuals or covering key events for those different powers that were um, active across Africa. And then in terms of our key themes, the material within this resource can be used to study or research a wide range of different themes from really broad themes like imperialism in the 19th century to the experience of women under imperialism to the establishment of infrastructure like the building of railways and other transport links. I'd also like to highlight the contextual features within this collection. We've created an interactive map feature, which illustrates these different powers at play across the 1870 to 1914 time period. It can be really difficult, especially for students or people coming to this um, area of study for the first time, to visualize these vast changes. And so we believe that having a visual representation of this across the time period can really help convey these huge changes and shifts in power dynamics. We also have a number of different guides to the material as kind of entry points into the content. And we've commissioned a number of academic essays. And a lot of these seek to address the gaps and silences present with material like this, which is widely from a colonial perspective. Some of the topics of the essays cover um, the creation of the state of Nigeria and its colonial and economic history, which is a fascinating case study on statecraft and the ongoing impacts of colonialism. The colonial violence in the archives, which covers, amongst other things, recognizing colonial violence in archival materials and reading for African experiences in archival materials as well. We have an essay on resistance to colonial rule, looking at both passive and active resistance, and again, how to read for this within archival documents, and using maps and cartography in the study of Africa's history, including the problems and biases that are present within historical maps. In terms of some of the collections that are presented within the resource, um, a lot of these collections are um, the papers and collections of key individuals and figures, um, and these are generally speaking European diplomats, explorers, missionaries and figures who were active within the region at this time. So because this resource focuses on the history of colonization, these are really essential um, collections to include. There are a number of um, individual, key individuals whose collections and papers we have, and some of them are listed here. We have the papers from, of David Livingston, Charles Gordon, Frederick Lugard, Flora Shaw. We also have the papers related to Roger Casement, Joseph Chamberlain, as well as Henry Morton Stanley and King Leopold II of Belgium. And these papers of individuals show their involvement in the colonialist establishment and expansion, and they're really essential for the study of this time period. All of that being said, though, although the named collections are, a lot of the named collections are the papers of European, generally men in power, such as diplomats, explorers, royalty, etc. Um, and while the material included within those collections is essential for the study of specifically of European involvement within the African continent in this particular time period. These aren't the only narratives that are present. 
Um, there are accounts and narratives from an African perspective or a non-European perspective. They do exist and are accessible within the material, but they are often through a European lens. And so we um, need to be mindful of this and contextualize it properly, which is what we've tried to do with our contextual pieces. So I'd highly recommend looking at our essays to support reading against the grain. But I wanted to also just highlight a couple of narratives of people who are not European diplomats or dignitaries. So on the left, we have um, a letter from some correspondence from King Kama III to Joseph Chamberlain. King Kama was a chief of the Benguatu people, and he did speak and write in English. He later lived in England. Um, but this specific letter was translated into English by an English person. And so while we have this letter from King Hama, there will be translation bias that exists within it. The second image of, is of Queen Ranavalona III of Madagascar. This is from a document from the British Library. It is a printed volume and it provides a history of Madagascar. It was written by a, a British woman who was a missionary. Um, and so within this um, document, there are the accounts of three Madagascan queens, Ranavalona the first, second and third. And these women were the last sovereign rulers of Madagascar. And they resisted colonialism and Christianity um, until Ranavalona the third eventually relented and publicly um, claimed herself as Christian. So again, this account is really interesting, but of course, um, there will be biases that are present because it's written from the perspective of a Christian woman who was a missionary. The third account um, is from a handful of letters from, that we have from Tipitip, who was a slave trader and became Leopold II's kind of right-hand man in the Congo. He employed a lot of really brutal tactics um, when he was involved in the slave trade. And this letter from Tipitip is him discussing meetings that he's had with English, Belgian and German diplomats. And it sounds quite disparaging, but again, the letter itself sound quite, sounds quite disparaging, but again, it's been translated into English by someone other than Tipitip. So while we must always be mindful that the content is usually from a European perspective, there are narratives from a non-European perspective that are, are available but we just always have to be careful about questioning our biases. And we've been um, quite keen to support students in, in doing so with our contextual pieces. So that's everything on Africa and the new imperialism, but I'm very happy to take questions at the end. Thank you. Thank you ever so much, Erin. That was absolutely fantastic. Okay, bear with me for two seconds, folks, because I'm going to take away Erin's ability to control my mouse but I am going to give it to our next speaker. So next up, um, I'll introduce Sophie Heath, who is one of the senior editors in our editorial production department. Now, Sophie's gonna be talking to you about Broadcasting America, as you might be able to tell from the slide that we have up currently. Um, the subtitle for that particular collection is The Rise of Mass Media and Communications. And it really does chart the impact of broadcasting innovations such as television, advertising and consumer culture as well. Now, Sophie, I have given you my mouse and you should be able to take control. Thank you very much, Dot. Yes, it looks like I can. Um, hello, everybody. So yes, as Dot said, I'm here to talk to you about Broadcasting America, which um, is going to be launched um, very soon. So that's very exciting. Um, excuse me, I'll find my notes here. So yes, so this project um, is allowing students to explore the history of 20th century American broadcasting um, through the papers and through the lens really of pioneer David Sarnoff and the Radio Corporation of America. You can chart the transformation of radio from one-to-one -one communication to a means of broadcasting to the masses, study the development of television and other broadcasting technologies, and really witness the impact of broadcasting innovations on um, topics such as manufacturing, advertising, consumer culture, censorship, global conflicts, and the space race. Some key data for you here. We um, have taken content from two archives for this particular resource. One is continuing our long-standing relationship with the Hagley Museum and Library. Um, so this is where the David Sarnoff Library um, now resides. And from there, we've also taken some um, collections to do with advertising um, and showcasing other kind of companies' involvement in the broadcasting industry. 
All of this is then supplemented by a fantastic pamphlet collection that has been taken from the special collections and university archives of the University of Maryland. This gives a really broad um, industry-wide look at the at, at broadcasting um, from the kind of 1920s all the way through to the 1980s um, and covers topics such as market research, um, censorship debates, uh, how to appeal to certain demographics like how to how to do uh, make programs for children or for women um, and is a really fantastic um, accompaniment to all the papers to do with the Radio Corporation of America and David Sarnoff's archives. Um, we have a range of contextual features as always that we are publishing with this resource so we have a mixture of um, in-house written pieces and those that have been commissioned from academics in the field. Um, part of the focus of this particular resource is is supporting students in understanding some of the technology of this particular topic um, so this is where the glossary comes in and also looking at biographies and company histories to really provide some context um, to all the different key players that um, will appear in the documents and um, allowing students to um, to really understand the the importance of those people and, and to understand the more scientific aspects of the of the topic as well. Um, key themes as you can see there is, is looking at the development of technology through radio and television, looking at the corporate history of the Radio Corporation of America um, and then as I said with the the pamphlet collections so we're looking at audience reception studies, consumer products and marketing, debates over censorship and ethics um, which continue to this day as to what is appropriate to broadcast um, on the television and, and on the radio and then also the the links between broadcasting and global current affairs. Some highlights for you from the collection. So we have the full run of RCA company periodical broadcast news and also the RCA annual reports. These have lots of details of RCA employees and different broadcasting stations and they also cover developments in technology and the broadcasting of different program types. Intended as an internal publication with a general readership, they're a really excellent introduction to key scientific and technical developments for those without a background in this area. So they're a fantastic entry point for students in this particular topic and they provide plenty of human interest stories and photographs too. Um, we also have an extensive collection of um, speech transcripts from David Sarnoff. Sarnoff was a really prolific speech giver, particularly in the, um, the latter half of his career. And his speeches are often very prophetic about the, the uh, potential future of the broadcasting industry. They discuss early concepts of television, video calling, emails, um, and his speeches also give further insight into the influence of RCA beyond manufacturing and broadcasting for the general public. So we have um, a selection of speeches that were given during the Cold War, and they demonstrate um, Sarnoff's connections with the US government and the military, and his hopes for the use of American broadcasting technology to further US foreign policy during this period. Um, the industry-wide advertisements that we have um, are a really fantastic way of tracing the evolution of radio and television technology. So you can see both the technical developments here, but also the creation of a consumer market. Um, so early radio adverts often focus on the amateur radioist who was building their own machines at home and um, wanted to buy the latest components. But later you can see the audience becomes more of what we would see as a typical consumer. So products are increasingly marketed for their aesthetics or their domestic value. Consumers are no longer expected to understand how the products are made and instead they should purchase the latest design. Um, and so this also demonstrates the shift from amateurs who built their own radio sets with the capability to broadcast to their local area to consumers who would purchase receivers um, which were intended to receive signals and play content produced by broadcasters and networks. We um, also have a fantastic range of photograph collections from RCA. Um, these are fantastic for looking at the corporate history of the company. We can see the manufacturing arm of it, as well as the actual broadcast studio um, settings. The files on patent disputes are particularly interesting. So RCA and most of, um, of the broadcasting companies, to be honest, were regularly involved in disputes over patents. Um, the broadcasting industry itself um, had quite a complicated beginning and, and everything was quite kind of muddy in terms of who owned the, uh, the rights to certain inventions. And certain corporations like RCA were very ready to protect their own interests and therefore were involved in a lot of um, legislative uh, patent disputes. Um, so these files offer an insight into that complex world um, and you can see the impact of the, uh, the outcomes of those on the scientists and on the corporations too. And then finally I've um, highlighted some documents relating to the space race and to satellite communications and this again demonstrates RCA's involvement with interests beyond public entertainment and public broadcasting. 
They worked with NASA in the development of cameras for use on the Apollo programs, as well as technology for lunar probes and satellite technology, um, which was initially for meteorological observations and then later for the development of cable television. Finally, I just wanted to highlight a particular um, topic really within the, um, the resource. So um, one of the, the um, fantastic parts of this is looking at um, radio and television firsts. And this particular one is the first live public mass broadcast of a sporting event, but to be honest, basically the first live public mass broadcast that existed. This took place in 1921 and it was used by David Sarnoff to demonstrate the potential of mass broadcasting to his managers at RCA. And it was the, the broadcast of the Dempsey Carpentier boxing match, named as one of the fights of the century um, for the 20s. And it's interesting really because it was a curious blend of a commercial broadcaster, so RCA, um, and working with amateur radioists. Um, so this is Sarnoff trying to um, demonstrate the potential of it because RCA actually had, didn't have the technical capabilities at this stage to, um, to do mass broadcasting. So they worked with volunteers um, around the US using their equipment um, to enable loudspeaker sounds. They set up um, radios in public spaces um, and set up around 100 mini radio stations to, to play the broadcast to um, yeah, transmit the, the signals. It was broadcast to theatres, halls, homes, ships. At least um, 350,000 people are estimated to have listened in live. Um, and interestingly, RCA were not allowed to broadcast directly from the arena. So the commentator um, would be speaking um, throughout the match. His words were then telegraphed to an engineer nearby who then read them out over the radio. So it's an interesting um, connection between the older technology of telegraphy and then the burgeoning industry of, of live broadcasting. It was also the first time that radio was used for live news. So those listening in heard the results much quicker than those who would wait for a newspaper to be printed. And it's an interesting example of, of the kind of earliest step of mass broadcasting. You can see the types of technology that were involved, the collaborative nature of the early industry, because it was also new and people were very much focused on very specific areas, the involvement of amateurs um, and the challenge of increasing your audience. Um, so on the slide here, you can see some images from the, the project um, about this event. You can see um, an analysis of some of the audience um, attendances. There are photographs of um, engineers setting up the equipment. And then on the far right, you can see Jack Dempsey himself listening to what was called a radio music box. Um, and above that is a letter from David Sarnoff, um, which references his radio music box um, dream. This is his idea slated as um, the first conception of consumer radio um, and was supposedly um, put forward in a memo of about 1915 or 1916, although that's become a subject of controversy because nobody's found the original, just slightly later references to it. Um, but through all of this, you can really see what a, a pioneer David Sarnoff was and a real visionary in this field. He was able to see the potential for technology. And as he moved up um, through the RCA ranks, he was able to employ the right people to carry out his visions. So this live broadcast was the start of a mass media industry that we all benefit from today for our entertainment, for our education, for our communications. I'm very much looking forward to this product being launched and for the research potential that it will enable. And I hope that you all enjoy exploring it too. Thank you very much. Thanks, Sophie. That was absolutely fascinating. Um, I think anybody who has previously taken a look at or maybe currently is using our collections um, I'm thinking of socialism on film in particular here. I think you'll you'll really enjoy some of the comparisons that you'll be able to make using um, the new Broadcasting America collection. And a really interesting kind of choice of document types that we've gone for there, which would really complement some of the, the video collections that we've got coming out, a couple of which, uh, in fact, one of which we'll be talking about later on today. So, um, next up, we have Matt Brand, Matthew Brand, who is an editor with our production department. Now, Matt is well aware that this is one of my favourite collections. We're going to talk now about Royal Shakespeare Company archives from playwrights to performance, um, covering not just the renowned RSC, but also their predecessor, the Shakespeare Memorial Theatre Company. Matt, I think you've got control there. Thanks, Dot. Am I audible? You are indeed, yes. Fantastic. So, um, yes, um, RSC Archives. So it's the latest in AM's growing portfolio of the actual collections. And these archives, they're held at the Shakespeare Birthplace Trust in Stratford-upon-Avon. 
they're an incredible resource for those who are interested in the history of performance in theatre. And I think it's fair to say that William Shakespeare needs no introduction, but maybe maybe we there are some, some people listening in who want a bit to hear it more about the RSC and indeed this collection. So the RSC and its predecessor, the SMT, as Dr. just said, they've been staging productions of the works of William Shakespeare in his hometown, Stratford upon Avon, and also further afield since the late 19th century. They have a reputation for meticulously researched, creative, often groundbreaking interpretations of the works of Shakespeare, and they're recognised as one of the most important global theatre companies of the 20th century. They also commission the plays from contemporary playwrights and perform canonical plays and other works dating all the way back to ancient Greece, and they're constantly referenced in performance, and his performance history and theatre research. Uh, to give a couple of examples of really important productions um, that are covered quite extensively in this resource, uh, you might people might want to be interested in, for example, in Peter Brooks' 1955 production of Shakespeare's Titus Andronicus, which was the first major production of this play in over a century, um, and another of Brooks' productions, his 1970 production of Midsummer Night's Dream, kitchen here, um, which were designed by Sally Jacobs, and this was a really radical imagining the play, not only in terms of the way it looks, its design, but also in its staging and its casting. Um, and the RSC has launched the careers of a huge number of major names, um, just among actors, they include Judy Dench, Helen Mirren, Vanessa Redgrave, David Tennant, Kenneth Brenner, Patrick Stewart and Ben Kingsley, just to name a few. Among the directors whose work can be traced in this collection, uh, John Gilgood, Peter Hall, Deborah Warner and Sam Mendes. So that's the RSC. What about the resource? Well, its backbone is the RSC's vast trove of prompt books, of which over 1400 feature here. The um, majority of these are for productions of the works of Shakespeare, but over 600 plays by a range of playwrights are represented. Um, to give you a comparison there, Shakespeare himself wrote or co-wrote 37, give or take, um, depending on um, whose view of it you're looking at. So the earliest prompt books in this collection date from 1889, um, and the resource goes up to 2013, so it's really quite an impressive date range here. And we're also including content relating to the RSC's 2016 production of The Tempest, which broke new ground in the application of computer-generated visuals in theatre. If you've seen some photos of it, I think mean, it really is amazing. Um, along with the prompt books, we have also digitised additional documentation related to 53 landmark productions, which have been selected as case studies by our editorial board of theatre practitioners and academics. These include two productions just mentioned. Another couple of examples are Trevor Nunn's quite famously austere 1977 Macbeth, Everyone Wears Black, the only um, real sort of scenery is a white circle on the stage. And um, David Edgar's epic 1980 adaptation of Dickens' Nicholas Nickleby. Um, we've also digitised the RSC's copy of first collected edition of Shakespeare's works, printed back in 1623, known as the First Folio. So what we've got here is a really unparalleled archival overview of the production history of a major theatre company over an extended period of time, which you can use to chart how interpretations of Shakespeare and indeed theatre in general have evolved over more than a century. So I think it might be useful to give a little more explanation on some of the types of content here. So prompt books, are annotated scripts which record directions, cuts and changes to the text, information concerning props, staging movement, all those sorts of detail. They're a working document for directors and stage managers to record how production is put together and how it runs. Um, and they often include designs, memoranda, show reports. In fact, everything you can see on the, stage, on the screen here is actually from a prompt book. Um, they also contain, in essence, all the information you need to create a theatre production or more importantly, the researcher, how to reverse engineer one. Um, some of the more early prompt books in this collection are also among the oldest known to have survived for some of Shakespeare's plays. Um, the prompt book for Brooks Titus Andronicus, which I just mentioned, is actually the only example for this play listed in the Shattuck catalogue, which is the go-to record for Shakespeare prompt books. For the case study production, we've included further documents, which will allow researchers the opportunity to delve even deeper. So, you think a prompt book allowing you to reverse engineer everything is great. 
Um, we're, we've got for these productions memoranda and emails detailing how creative decisions were reached and the debates that went into them. There are photographs of productions in rehearsal and on stage. We have original costume designs, musical scores, designs for props and stages, understudy lists and show reports which record everything from running time to audience reaction. And as I'm also alluded to, we're also including a copy of the first folio so you'll be able to compare contemporary productions with the earliest authoritative text of many of these plays, although I should add that each copy of the folio is unique due to the compositor's various spellings and the fact that much of the volume was being proof while it was being printed. Not, I should add, common practice in the publishing industry today. Um, and there are some great tools to aid research as well. For the vast majority of the productions that you can trace in this collection, we've got extensive credits tagged against documents. There are over 5,000 actors alone who are tagged in this resource, so users will be a click or two away from loading all of the content that might relate to plays starring Judy Dench, all the plays directed by Nancy Meckler, or all the plays directed by, say, for example, The Motley Group, which is this all-female collective of theatre designers in mid-20th century London. Um, for an Sorry, to maximise the opportunities for comparative study, there will also be a new split screen viewer, um, which can be used to compare any two documents in the resource right next to each other. So you can compare two prompt books for different productions of the same play, production records for a play with the prompt book relating to it, or even costume designs with photos of the actors on stage. We've got contextual essays written by leading scholars, including pieces on staging, how directors interpreted Shakespeare's plays for different eras, and how to read prompt books and get the most out of them. We've also included video interviews, which we worked with key RSC personnel for. So we've got an introduce, introduction to the company and its history and its practices with the artistic director emeritus, Greg Doran, for example. Um, and with this being a really visually rich collection, there are galleries to browse with the visual highlights, not just the designs and photographs, but also stage plots and more technical drawings, which you can use to retrace how actors moved on stage. Um, there are also biographical profiles of major contributors, a glossary of theatrical and RSC specific terminology, and the chronology of major events in the company's history, all of which provide additional content for all of the documents included and all in one place in one website. So I thought I'd also bring up some highlights here. So this is a personal highlight of mine. Uh, this is the prompt book for the 1986 production of Romeo and Juliet directed by Michael Bogdanov. It's known as the yucky Romeo and Juliet. It was set in contemporary northern Italy. Everyone's wearing amazing suits, huge quantities of hairspray. It's an astoundingly beautiful play to look at the photos, but the prompt book itself is astoundingly detailed. Um, the directions, I mean, at one point in the play, and I promise this is the page, the text is tiny, but if you zoom in on the site, you can read it fine. Um, there's a direction on this page for one of the actors to jump off a balcony and be caught by six of their colleagues. Um, the directions are right there, and there is just so much in here. There are directions for fights, and right at the end you get this brilliant piece um, where the um, prologue for the play, normally at the start, well, it's actually at the end in this one, it's presented as a press conference. Um, you also have the show reports for the production, which you can compare against this prompt book, and I'm happy to report that the stage dive was carried out without anyone being hurt. Um, another really cool highlight, so this is a 1984 production of Richard III. Um, having the original costume designs available in this resource is really cool. You can compare, as we can here, uh, the original costume design for Richard III and the photo of um, the eventual costume being worn by the late Tony Sher on stage um, playing Richard. As you can see, it's a lavishly designed production and comparing the director's vision with the resulting costume, you can see the overall effect is the same. But there isn't a hat, the fabrics are a little different, and the crutches which Cher used to propel himself across the stage, they do look rather more practical, I think you'll agree, than um, the rather knobbly original. So this is a really fabulous collection. Um, I hope I've done it justice in the time available to me. Um, and if you have any questions, I'll be more than happy to answer them. This is a really amazing project to have worked on, and. I'm looking forward to seeing what people can do with the um, with the resulting resource. Fab. Thank you ever so much, Matt. I think you've given us a brilliant taster of RSC there. 
I am going to hand over to my next presenter here. But just before I do, I did want to jump on what Matt said at the end there. And do remember, you can send through questions for any of the presenters that we've had so far. We have two more coming up. But if you have any questions for Matt, Sophie or Erin, then please do pop them through using your questions panel um, on your GoToWebinar. Uh, navigation panel, I suppose, is what I would call it. Okay, so next up we have Jade. Jade Bailey is an assistant editor in our production team. She's going to be talking about the British newsreels between 1911 and 1930. So that is a collection of topical budget newsreels. Um, Jade is probably about to correct me, but Jade, I believe they're all drawn from the British Film Institute and the Imperial War Museums. Uh, that's spot on, Dot. Great, glad to hear it. Take it away, Jade. Great, okay, well, thanks very much, everyone. Um, so, uh, hot on the heels of Victorians on Film, which launched last year, um, we're very excited to be publishing later this year, uh, British Newsreels 1911 to 1930, Culture and Society on Film. This is a very exciting resource which comprises more than 7,000 early 20th century newsreels, all of which were produced by the Topical Budget Company between 1911 and 1930. Uh, and as Dot said, the films have been digitised from reels held at the British Film Institute, which holds the bulk of the collection, and also the Imperial War Museums. So just to give an overview of the collection, um, the Topical Budget Company was active from 1911 to 1931, uh, self-described itself as the Great British Newsreel. Um, it was one of the big three newsreel companies active in Britain in the early 20th century, the other two being Gourmont Graphics and Pathé Gazette. Um, it initially operated as an independent company, but was purchased in 1917 by the British War Office and used as a propaganda tool during the First World War, helping to maintain the morale of the British public um, before it was then purchased again after the war by newspaper owner Edward Holton in 1919. Following Holton's acquisition, Topical Budget reached a peak audience of 5 million during this period, uh, then slowly declined in popularity until it was closed down in 1931. So an early precursor of modern TV news shows, newsreels were short form visual news content intended to inform and entertain the public. They were black and white and entirely silent, so relied on title and intertitle cards to contextualize the footage. They were originally shown in cinemas across Britain with new issues produced twice a week, each issue containing between four and seven stories, which are individual films, a minute or two at most in length. Um, and we are hoping to publish this, con this uh, product in September this year. It's an entirely video resource which collates and presents the entire corpus of surviving topical budget films for the first time. Um, next slide, please. Thank you. So the, the key um, feature of this resource is that it's the content um, contained in British newsreels is incredibly diverse and covers a very wide range of themes. I've listed a few there um, and I've also included a few uh, screenshots from a selection of the films. Um, so the themes included um, cover things such as uh, arts and culture, so there's a lot of films featuring celebrities of the day, theatre stars, early film stars, stage performances and fashion shows, youth and education, there are quite a lot of films featuring university events, um, government and politics features uh, figures such as Churchill and Lloyd George come up in the footage, society and leisure. So there's quite a lot of really lovely footage in this uh, collection showing ordinary people just going about their lives. There's a lot of things like ice skating, people um, attending dog shows is quite a, a common topic that comes up a lot. 
Um, sport is a really big topic as well. There's a lot of coverage of football matches, rugby matches, tennis matches, boxing and cricket. Uh, work and industry, footage of um, people working in all kinds of industries. Uh, royalty is a really big theme. Um, also, the First World War is a key part of the resource. Uh, and we see a lot of propaganda films and rehabilitation of veterans coming up as a theme. Uh, natural disasters, a um, little bit like today, you'll have films covering um, major events that happen both in Britain and around the world. Uh, empire and foreign relations, including the uh, Irish independence um, that occurred during this period. Uh, women and gender, and also science, technology and transport, um, to name but a few of the many, many topics that come up in these films. Um, next slide, please. So the range of themes in this collection make it applicable to researchers and students working across multiple fields in incredibly wide ranging content um, really complements um, a whole range of our other resources, including uh, Victorians on film, most notably. Um, as I mentioned previously, this is the first time that the entire topical budget collection of films will be published together, uh, which will allow researchers to work across the whole collection at once. Um, a key aspect of this publication is uh, the digitization work involved preserves of posterity the volatile and fragile silver nitrate film that uh, these newsreels are uh, filmed on, which is degrading sort of on a day by day basis. Um, and we are also planning to include uh, essays and video interviews which will address key themes and research. Have we lost you there, Jade? Looks like we might have lost Jade. However, what I will say is that we do, she has fantastically prepared for us um, a little sneak preview of the topical budget films. So I am going to play one of those for you now. Please be aware this is a silent film, so you will not be hearing any audio. Hi Darts, yes, um, hopefully you can hear me okay. Um, right, well thanks for having me today. Um, I'm the development editor for the 1980s project. I've been working on the project for four years now and prior to that the idea for the project first came about back in 2013 and 
it was initially envisioned as the next module of our popular culture in Britain and America portfolio of resources. But as we developed the project, it really grew into its own. And we found that both with copyright limitations and also the changing needs of our audience, that the focus became more on producing a resource that really captures the boom and bust element of the 1980s and provide sources that tell a story of the decade from a multitude of perspectives, focusing particularly on minor minority voices and communities. So this is a multi-archive project bringing together a wide range of source material and given the range of sources available for the study of contemporary history, including new media formats, our aim with this resource is to showcase the range of content and include methodological essays and content to introduce students to the source materials. We're focusing on the US and UK, but also have supplementary content from Australia and Canada covering similar themes. And our focus has been on domestic events specifically, especially as resources on similar time periods tend to focus on foreign affairs. Our focus for this resource is to look at more local events, movements and ideas. It's aimed at contemporary history and cultural studies scholars, but we're looking to appeal to a wide range of um, researchers from, from novice to advanced um, through the range of source materials that we're including. And we feel this is a, a really opportune time to introduce a resource on the 1980s. As, as Professor Matt Worley said, who's one of our board members, it's now considered the, the frontier of modern history. So given it's, it's such a rich and, and complicated decade and with a living memory of so many people, our approach has been to thematically organise the resource around key themes. And our aim is to do what Professor Lucy Robinson from the University of Sussex says, is to capture the messiness of the decade and provide a flavour of the various social, political and welfare movements. And the idea is that users will be able to study uh, source materials from a range of repositories. So there'll be government materials, but also grassroots materials so that users can study these key themes from a multitude of perspectives and the cross searchability of the resource, being able to look at sources from various archives is, is a key USP with this. So in terms of themes, as you can see, we're looking to cover various social issues um, and, and many issues pertaining to race, class, gender and sexuality. But then we're also looking to look at um, mainstream consumer culture to alter alternative lifestyles and subcultures. So a real mix of politics and culture. And particularly as a lot of um, music movements at the time, for instance, were really um, sort of politically motivated um, we found that this sort of really um, bring makes the source material hang together quite quite strongly so as I mentioned I'm really looking to include a breadth of source material in this resource and we've got a range of content from manuscripts to printed materials it's also a very visual collection as well and we've got lots of photographs as well as audiovisual content, including advertisements, as well as oral histories. And we'll be including those top level government documents right down to zines and DIY newsletters and print materials. So in terms of document highlights, um, just to talk through some of these now, we've got a lot of grassroots roots newsletters and serials from the Interference Archive, which is a a volunteer-led cooperative in Brooklyn, as well as the University of Warwick's Modern, Modern Record Centre. And these cover various local uprisings and social justice movements. We've also got organisational records from regional campaign groups, such as the Leamington Anti-Racist, Anti-Fascist Committee, to international charities, such as Friends of the Earth. 
the Atari Coin Up Division Corporate Records um, is a fantastic collection for researching gaming culture of the decade. And we're featuring various arcade games such as Asteroid, Centipede, Battlezone, APB, and Arabian. And users will be able to research the, the full sort of life cycle of the game from early development to marketing. Our music and subculture zines are sourced from Bowling Green State University and other archives. And these cover a variety of genres from punk to disco, rap and reggae and more. And um, these cover quite an impressive um, regional area as well from across the states, but also um, more further afield. Um, there's examples from East Germany, Germany, for example. And then we've got photographs of key events, movements, trends and celebrities from the, the Daily Mirror archive. And these will be used to illustrate a timeline and they provide a great visual snapshot of the decade. So I've just got a few visual examples of those serials and zines. So as you can see, really fantastic visual content. A lot of the materials we're including have quite small print runs um, and some are very much of a DIY nature. And here the examples include um, the disarmament movement, uh, the anti-nuclear movement, we've got black coverage of the Black Panthers in the centre there. At the bottom right you can see the culture around Star Trek um, and the associated fandom and then uh, there's a copy of What Wave magazine there which covered punk movements. And here is an example of some of the photography from the, the Daily Mirror archive. So as you can see it, it really gives a great um, visual introduction to the decade from pop culture to subcultures to protests, rallies, uh, new technology and uh, elections as well. Additional features are, are a key part of this, this resource because we're aiming at um, undergraduates as well as more advanced researchers. The additional features have really been designed to introduce students to the resource materials. So we've got our, our usual body of essays as well as video interviews. We really want to make the most of this being a decade within living memory. And so we'll be doing interviews with some key figures represented in the source materials. We've got that chronology um, that's going to be illustrated with photographs and videos. Thematic guides, um, as you can see, the themes that we're covering are quite broad and given the number of archives that will be contributing to the project, these guides will help researchers sort of see the spread of content um, covered by this theme to enable that, that cross searching. There's also a number of organisations featured in the resource, quite a plethora given we're including so many um, sort of low run, low circulation print magazines and organisational records. And so there'll be an index there introducing those organisations. We'll have exhibitions such as a gallery of obsolete technology, um, a music and fandom gallery uh, exploring various genres and subcultures to emerge during the decades. And then given the visual um, Sort of richness of the resource there'll be several visual galleries for the Mirapix photographs we're also including objects of games and toys from the Strong Museum of Play and advertising as well lots of great um, advertisements catalogues posters from the Bowling Green State University and users will be able to access the documents by theme but also through zines um, or history and film so I'll, I'll leave it there. Thank you very much. Fantastic. Thank you ever so much, Sophie. OK, so we have approximately five minutes left. It looks like we do have a couple of questions already in our questions uh, panel here. So I'm going to go through a couple of those. Just a reminder, anybody else that has any questions, please do feel free to ask questions of all of our panelists here. Um, Sophie, in fact, seeing as you've just been talking, I will come to you first. We do have a question. Um, you've mentioned that this is a resource that focuses largely on the UK and the US. Um, 
but we have somebody asking, is there any content covering Northern Ireland or the Troubles? Thank you for the question. Um, yes, there is. We're looking to include some government records, looking at the Troubles, and there's also some uh, sort of zines and serials uh, looking at the Troubles. A lot of um, sort of left-wing political publications mention the Troubles as well. So um, the Interference Archive, for example, includes some subject files on, on Northern Ireland and the Troubles. Um, so yeah, quite unusual, rare content there. Fantastic. Thank you ever so much, Sophie. Um, I'm going to jump back all the way to the start now. We've got a question for Erin, who was talking about Africa and the new imperialism. Somebody has asked here, Erin, how did you narrow down which collections and documents to include within the resource? Thank you. Yeah, that, that's an interesting point. So um, it is quite tricky to narrow down which material should be included within the research. It is quite a broad, um, a very broad geographical area. So um, we, our, my colleague within development who managed the, the kind of the initial development of the resource, um, kind of did a lot of research into major events, major players um, within this time period. And we always make our selections in consultation and collaboration with our editorial boards as well. Um, and the kind of main driving force for this collection was to focus on the process of imperialism within this very specific time period because we're covering such a huge geographic area. So we sort of zoom in on the events that are um, leading up to 1870 and then throughout the kind of late 19th century and um, the, the Berlin Conference, which is a major sort of event um, within this time period. Um, and then the aftermath of the Berlin Conference, but we're not really focused on the kind of ongoing administration of um, the, the various different empire, empire powers that were active in Africa. So it is tricky, but we tried to sort of limit the time period because we um, had such a large geographic area as well. Thank you. Thank you, Erin. Um, okay, we have a few more questions coming through. So Matt, I believe we'll go to you next. So we have a question here about the RSC collection um, and they've asked what kinds of non-Shakespeare plays are included in the prompt books? Is that one you think you can answer? Hi Matt, I'm just wondering if perhaps you need to unmute. Perhaps not, perhaps having some trouble unmuting. In that case, what we'll do is we will jump to Sophie Heath instead. Sophie, it looks like we've got a question here. Um, oh, what other document, oh sorry, what other American broadcasting companies feature in the sources in Broadcasting America? Sophie, do you think you'd be able to answer that one for me? Uh, hello, yes, hopefully you can hear me. I can um, indeed, thank you. Fantastic. Uh, yes, so the Radio Corporation of America is the main focus of the project because of, of um, we have such a significant proportion of the material comes from the David Sarnoff Library and um, that was obviously the corporation that he was so heavily involved with um, throughout his career. But there are lots of other companies um, from the broadcasting industry that also feature. Um, these are uh, manufacturers or broadcasters as well. So companies such as Victor Talking Machine, um, which became part of the Radio Corporation of America um, at one stage in its history. And then also companies such as General Electric, Marconi, Western Electric, Westinghouse, uh, American Telegraph and Telephone, uh, AT&T, and um, Atwater Kent as well, just to, to name a few. So these um, the papers for these uh, companies are often adverts um, for their products or trade catalogues. There are also some company papers or company histories, um, and they also crop up in um, those patent disputes that I was talking about earlier as well. Um, so you can really see the, the collaborations between these different companies um, and the competition as well. So it is a, it's um, yeah very complementary to the RCA material. Great. OK, look, folks, I think that is all we have time for today. So I will leave you with this information. If you are interested in any of the collections that we've talked about today, 
please do check out our corporate site www.amdigital.co.uk and on that site you are able to arrange free trials for all of the collections that you've seen today once they have launched so I would strongly encourage all of you to check out that site you can also find more information about the archives involved and the different themes that will be covered there as well also hopefully we'll see you on Thursday for our part two of what's new in 2023 Thank you very much for joining me and we'll see you later this week.